34, we get a slight variation of this formula um, by introducing the idea that we're to consider the universalized maxim as a law of nature. So here we get a variation. Act as if the maximum of your action were to become by your will a universal law of nature. So this is adding the sort of systematic understanding of nature to simply universal law. Okay, before I go, um, I'll remind you, I think I mentioned this before, that Kant is going to give a few different formulations of the categorical imperative. He says that they're all equivalent to one another, one another but they can be expressed in different ways. Um, and so this is only the first of these different formulations. Um, a, a few quick points about this. First of all, it's not entirely obvious that they are, in fact, equivalent. I'm going to try to bring out the connection between them for you. Um, um, so we'll try to find a way of connecting them. Um, but mm, there's controversy about this. Second, um, although Kant seems to say that this is somehow more fundamental, that this formula of universal law is more fundamental, and critics tend to focus on it, there are some problems with it, as we'll see. One thing that's interesting, I think I mentioned this to you also, is that in the Metaphysics of Morals, where Kant actually tries to derive substantive moral duties from it. Almost always he uses the second main formulation that we're going to talk about, not this one. Um, and third, another way of thinking about the relationship between these different formulations um, might be this, that each of the formulations brings out a different aspect or dimension of this um, fundamental law, the fundamental moral law. And so maybe what we should be doing is trying to use them together. So maybe this first formulation, although correct as far as it goes, is incomplete unless we have the resources of the other formulations. So we'll see that just in a second. Okay, uh, so now he's about to start talking about examples. Um, and I want to mention these but not go into too much depth about them. I want to remind you that the categorical imperative is not supposed to be a mechanical decision procedure. It's not supposed to be something that automatically spits out the right answer to moral dilemmas. All you have to do is crank the handle, um, and, and dilemmas disappear. In part, this is because Kant thinks judgment is required um, in order to apply any abstract rule or concept. Um, you need to have judgment to apply that. Second, remember, as I emphasized last time, um, we, there's always going to be a question of what the maxim that somebody actually was acting on was. Um, so here, Khan is just going to stipulate what the maxim is, and then supposed to figure out um, uh, what morality requires of that. OK, next. Um, Kant thinks that we have duties to ourselves and duties to others. And Kant thinks we have so-called perfect duties and imperfect duties. Um, so this is going to generate four different categories. Perfect and imperfect duties to ourselves, perfect and imperfect duties to others. Um, and those are the four examples that Kant is going to give, one of each. A couple more notes about this. These examples are not supposed to be controversial. Kant is taking it to be obvious that this is what common sense morality requires. We're just trying to see how these 
common sense judgments about morality are related to the categorical order. Second, the question that we're asking of these maxims, as always, is whether they are permissible or impermissible. So we're going to ask whether these maxims can be universalized, can be willed to be universal laws. If they can be, then they're permissible. If they cannot be, then they're impermissible. All of these examples are going to be impermissible. Third, Kant breaks with the traditional view and rejects the idea that there are any duties to God. The duties that he's talking about here exhaust the categories. They're duties to oneself, duties to other, others. He also breaks with the traditional view and says that there are perfect duties to oneself. Um, and finally, one last point, that this classification of perfect and imperfect duties to self and others, it gets much more complicated in metaphysics and morals. So this is only a kind of preliminary statement, which he actually mentions at the bottom of in, in the footnote there. Okay, so I said that all four of these maxims are supposed to fail the test of universalizability. So all four of these maxims are supposed to be not permissible. The first two examples are supposed to be uh, involve perfect duties um, that involve doing certain things for certain purposes. So making a false promise or killing oneself to achieve some end. Those are supposed to be maxims that are not permissible. And the failure of these maxims, so the, these first two maxims say, I will do something in order to um, achieve some end. Uh, the fact that these um, fail is supposed to show that those actions are not permissible. And so they're supposed to be perfect so what we're trying to say is that sacrificing yourself for a greater good. So we'll, we'll, I, 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 I promise I will actually talk about each of these in a second. I'm still setting this up. Um, so a failure of these maxims to be universalizable um, is supposed to show that there are, um, that you may not do these things. And so there are perfect duties not to do that. The two maxims, the next two maxims, are supposed to involve imperfect duties. Both of these maxims have you avoiding some action for some reason. So you are not doing something for some reason or other. There's a maxim that says, I'm not going to do this for some reason. And these maxims also can't be universalized. This means that you, so this is not developing your talent or not helping somebody when they're in need. So again, these are supposed to be maxims that cannot be universalized, so it's impermissible to act on them. This means it's not permissible not to do certain things. It's not permissible not to do certain things. But this doesn't yet show us exactly what is required of us to do. Say that one more time. The first two examples tell us I'm not going to sorry, tell us that I'm going to do something for some reason that can't be universalized, so we get a perfect duty not to do that. Something that we may never do. We're not ever allowed to do that. The next two examples say I'm not going to do something for a certain reason. Kant claims that does not universalize, so it's not permissible not to do certain things. But that doesn't tell us when we are required to do certain things. So we're going to get imperfect duties here. We must do certain things, but we don't know exactly when or how, to what extent, if we're supposed to do that. Okay, so that suggests that the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties is closely related to so-called negative and positive. 
Okay, so the four examples are going to be a perfect duty to oneself. Um, that is not to kill oneself for certain kinds of reasons. A perfect duty to others, not to lie, make a lying promise. Then we get an imperfect duty to oneself to develop one's talents, and an imperfect duty to others to show beneficence. So I'll talk about these quickly on Wednesday, then we'll move on to talk about the, um, the second main formulation, and I hope we'll get done with the second section, so we'll see the third and final main formulation. Third. And we'll have to go quickly through part three on Friday. That might spill over a little bit onto Monday, but then we'll be done.